So I have a, I have a survey for you. Um, just as a, a, a quick aside, uh, so I had, um, I had a, a quick conversation with um, the head of security for, for a telecoms company um, last week. Um, I won't mention the name, but all I'll say is they had a, they had a high profile hack very, very recently. Um, and uh, it's, it's the same word twice with four letters. And uh, so I said, God, you must have your work cut out at the moment. It must be really difficult. And he said, actually, it's never been easier. And the reason is, is because he said, it's bored now, listen to him. So this, this is one of the challenges that we have, is that security should start at the top down. And it shouldn't be something that's layered in as a, as a thing for compliance. So I've got the, I've got the title, State of the Cyber Nation. Uh, we have a, we had um, we had a, a, um, a real-time hack monitor up, up there that's basically telling us that, that, uh, that China's attacking us continually, day and night. Um, but I have some, I have some uh, light-hearted questions to kind, of, to kind of start you off. And question number one is, what is your relationship with the internet? Yeah. A test question to explain functionality. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's in brackets. Okay, so I don't read that. So, so, is your relationship that you've sold your soul to the internet? Number one, have you met your partner online, current or past? Uh, that's far too personal a question. Or in, into what? So, you should have a device in front of you. You should be able. You should be able to. Uh, you should be able to vote. So we. Okay, and the scores on the doors are? Uh, just as you receive, we have 20 seconds left. Okay, let's go. Well, that's, that's very interesting. Um, so, so, selling your soul to the internet. So, uh, you know, what, what price? What price is your data worth? So, so because, you, because you want to be involved in the internet community, you tell them your date of birth. You, you tell them your middle name. Um, you, you tell them the name of your children. Uh, all these kind of things. You, you join social groups which tell people your favorite sport. You tell people when you get engaged, when you're married. All, all, these, kind of, all, all these kind of things. And this, this is kind of part of the challenge. And, and the big piece here, whilst we can talk about systems, and we can talk about IL-5, which is, which is as uh, my colleague explains, a bit last year, because that's a standard which did exist and now doesn't exist. Uh, and this is part of the problem. There are no real standards across government. But the real challenge is people. And security is something which starts at the top. Physical security is one thing. It's great to lock the doors. But if somebody says, hey, mate, can I borrow your key, then you've got a problem. So anyway, that's, a, that's an aside. So on to question number two, because I've been told to keep it brief. Have you ever been hacked? And we have, number one, not as far as I know. Number two, often. Number three, the systems I use are invincible. And number four, hacked. How many people do we have in the room, by the way? I think it's from 30, but around 45 are locked. Um, it, should, it should finish automatically as I get okay. the answers, but let's get... So again, and this, this, is, this, is a, this is a good answer. So, not, not as far as I know. Um, so, and this is the scary thing, really, is that probably we all have been, um, and that's that's not being do, not not doom and gloom. Bits about my background: um, uh, cybersecurity, MOD, secure hosting, lots of stuff for government, a um, lot on compliance systems for NHS, um, Home Office, various, um, and. It's the, it's the not as far as I know. So how, how are we measuring this stuff? Um, it's, it's OK. Um, for example, um, if somebody, if somebody uh, breaks into your house and they, they break down the front door, you know how they got in. They leave, they leave footprints. 
muddy footprints over your, over your, um, your rug in the lounge, and they go through your sock drawer and they throw everything out. What you don't know is wherever else they've been. So everybody replaces their toothbrush. Fair comment? Because you don't know. So one of the real challenges is, is audit. So how do you actually protect your systems? And if you think there's a problem, how do you check whether there is or there isn't? And a big part of this is, is actually the checking or the checksumming of all your data. So without wanting to, without wanting to skew the questionnaire, who here actually checks the integrity of their data to check if it's been changed? OK, so I'm, I'm not looking around. I'm not going to point anybody out that has or hasn't. Um, but but this, is, this is really, really important, P particularly um, in the world of big data, where you're actually creating smart business outcomes by analysing data. If somebody wants to be particularly Machiavellian and steer you towards an investment, a vendor choice, an investment from government to a particular city, why not just change all that data that somebody's going to put into a report, create a completely different outcome? That, that stuff's scary. Also, a big, a big concern is intellectual property theft. So this isn't changing data. This is going in, looking at the stuff that's really, really dear to you, reading it, copying it. You've, you've no idea what's going on. All you know is you've got a competitor that's appeared over the other side of the world, and they've, they've had an idea before you, or you think, actually, it's your idea. They borrowed it. So question number three. Where do you store your passwords? So I only use the one. I saw a, nod, a bit of nodding there. Um, on a post-it note stuck to my PC. And I joke you not, I went to a conference the other day and the, the, uh, the laptop um, on the welcome desk had a post-it note on it saying welcome with a capital W and there was a, a zero with a, a line slash through it for the O. And I thought, they're not actually saying welcome. That's the password, isn't it? And so I asked, I asked the, the, um, the person behind the desk, um, what's on that laptop? And she goes, oh, nothing. So I said, well, has it got all the delegate names from this conference? And she said, yep. Um, has it got anything from any of the conferences? Oh, yeah, from every, every conference. Oh, OK. OK, no problem. Are you going to be next to that all day? Oh, no, I'm going to go. So you can see where this is going. Um, so what do we get to? Post-it note on PC. I use an automated passcode system, or no need as I can remember my children's names and birthdays. OK, so we've got some good diligence here. So automated passcode system seems to be up at the top. So the thing about automated passcode systems is they're still providing you something which, if it's automated, generally it's a bit more complicated. And us humans don't do complicated, so we write it down. As soon as we write something down, we're back to the post-it note scenario. So does anybody here use two-factor authentication? <laughs> Brilliant. Exactly. And that's, so I heard, I heard the, the comment sometimes at the front here. And again, that's, that's another thing. As soon as something becomes inconvenient, then we bypass it because we're human. So, so security has to be something that's really easy to use and absolutely transparent to you. Otherwise, you do you find a way to, to, to circumvent it. So the questions get a bit more technical now. So question number four, uh, what is the function of a firewall? Is it to control what's exposed to the network? <laughs> Decide which websites are safe to enter or not? I don't need firewalls, or fire what? <laughs> Sorry? Oh, I thought that was a phishing attack. <laughs> I think one of, the, one of the answers is a little bit misleading there, possibly. Um, so, yeah, control 
what is exposed to the network, or, or probably more so um, what the network exposes to the wider world, really, I think is probably what it's really trying to say, but I think you've all worked that out. Um, so yeah, okay, so you've all got firewalls, you know what they're for, brilliant stuff. Um, the most important configuration, this, get, this gets more technical. The, the most config, important configuration file on your firewall is the something file. Is it the access list? Is it the data file? Is it the rules file? Or is it the nail file? No one better vote green. <laughs> There will be some green answers in there. There must be. We must have, a, we must have some mischievous people. Fantastic. Three. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I guess this is, this is one of the other things. And again, it's, 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 a, it's a human thing. So firewalls are configured by humans, generally. How petrifying is that? So regardless of what the configuration file is, generally it comes from a human. There's heuristics on top of that, so firewalls can also learn what's bad, but it's based on human behavior and human rules. So one of the ways that you can, you can kind of get around, and I'm sure some of my colleagues will talk, talk about this, one of the ways you can kind of get around some of these, these problems is to constantly or periodically penetration test your systems. And there's automated tools for doing this. And they, they just check, basically. They go, is, is the door locked? Uh, is there anything, has anybody made a mistake? And you can, you can buy this as a service in the cloud. You can get platforms that will run this. But it basically, it'll look across your estate and just check that nobody's made a silly mistake or left something open or not quite put a full stop at the end of a line and, and something hasn't been read by your firewall. So these are the kind of tools that are part of what is good diligence and good practice. And um, some of my colleagues will talk about good diligence and good practice and how you can share this information via platforms such as CISP a little later on. So question number six. How does a VPN make a network more secure? Does it mask your data so no one can see it? Does it sound really advanced, which could scare hackers? Does it create a virtual point-to-point -point connection, or never heard of this? And the scores. Fantastic. OK. so. So yeah, it does. It makes a virtual point-to-point -point connection, and this is this is also something that um, it's worth asking your IT department because um, a lot of people think that um, a VPN hides your traffic. Sometimes it does. Sometimes it doesn't. And one of the things that um, people do is called split tunneling. So they say, okay, any traffic that you send from from your computer when you've got your VPN connected to your office. It knows what path that is, and it goes, oh, yeah, I'll encrypt that. That's, 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 what, that's what we want to protect. But then when you access your, your Gmail or Facebook or LinkedIn or something else, if you're running split tunneling, none of that traffic's encrypted. And sometimes companies think it's, it's best practice to do this because they don't, they don't want to be involved in your personal traffic. So they say, OK, anything that's not d destined for the company network we won't tunnel um, because they don't want any claims or any issues of, them, of people saying, you might be looking at our traffic because even my personal stuff's going through this VPN. But it's got to the point where it's, it's practiced now and not many people actually know that this is happening. So you might go to a conference overseas, think, oh yeah, I'll tunnel all my traffic over my corporate VPN. And actually, only the stuff going to your company is actually going through the VPN. Um, mindful of time, question number seven. How long does it take for a hacker to crack a six-character password? Is it a day, 10 minutes, three minutes, or two hours? And I'm sure you all think it, it depends. So 
So, so whilst you're all voting, it really does depend. If, if, it's, if it's a six-character password and it's based on any dictionary that exists on the planet, then you're looking at maybe a tenth of a second, some, something around that. If it's a dictionary word with a number in it, replacing one of the common characters, like a, a four uh, for, a, for an A and all this kind of stuff, um, which, is, which is great stuff because humans can remember this, yet you always replace your, 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 your A with a four and your E's with a three, and that's cool, uh, and your, your O's with a zero, then it takes about a second. I mean, it depends on what kind of uh, platforms you've got. But um, if you want to buy Google Compute or Amazon Compute or, or Azure, um, nearly, nearly forgot where we were, um, and buy computing as a service, then you can, you can access a massive amount of computing crunch resource, a supercomputer amount worth of crunching resource. So, so I believe the, um, the correct answer here is 10 minutes. Um, um, we've got a lot of people that said three minutes, but it depends on how much resource you want to buy. And if you've only got one password to crack and you only want to buy a couple of minutes of supercomputing resources and hundreds of cores of processors, it doesn't cost much money. So you can cause some real damage. And the message there really is, if somebody wants to hack you, the only thing that you've got really here to help you, um, unless you absolutely tool up in every single direction, which is impossible because we're human and we have finite resources company-wise, is to hide in the noise. When, you, when, you saw the, when we saw the, um, the diagram before, um, showing the real-time hack attempts, here we go again. Okay. Is the only thing we've got really to protect us is the world's a big place and we're protected by statistics. So if somebody does want to hack you, they can buy as much resource as they want online. They can buy bespoke code on the dark internet to actually attack and exploit your particular systems. They'll actually go, they'll actually go to a, a provider and say, this is the company I want, I want to actually exploit. How would you recommend I do it? As a consultancy service. So, and, so last question. Again, mindful of time. Question number eight. Uh, I touched on this a little earlier. Do you maintain an, aud an integrity audit of your systems? And the, answer, the questions are, well, the answers are yes, always. Not my area of responsibility, so I don't need to know. I'm sure we do, if it's a good idea. So I'm sure we do all that, that best practice stuff, which is the, the standard CEO answer. Yes, we have a team of trained professionals, and they adhere to every standard and what have you. Sometimes these are the uncomfortable questions to ask in the boardroom of your CTO. So do we have an integrity audit? You know, just, just humor your, 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 um, your slightly ignorant CEO. Do we, do we do this stuff? Or four, what? So a good, a good balance there. And actually, that that says a lot about the calibre of the people in this room because that is actually um, quite, a, quite a high and reassuring answer. Um, I've been in a lot of rooms where the answer to qu that question or questions like it is, is of, the, of the what. So how can we be sure that none of our data has been altered? Do we keep an offline copy of it? Can we compare the offline copy to the online copy? Can we do it regularly? Can we be sure the offline copy is safe? All this stuff does eventually come back to people. And the, my, my closing comment on, about people is that whilst um, cybersecurity is, is, a, is a global problem, people, um, people are parochial. Um, they, they, aren't, they aren't global in their own right. They're not ubiquitous. One person isn't spread as a thin layer, as a monofilm across the planet. So whilst we address cybersecurity globally, one of the initiatives that's been formed by CERT, which is the uh, Computer Emergency Response Team, is an initiative called CISP, which is the Cyber Information Sharing Partnership. And what that does is it allows companies to share best practice amongst each other on a regional basis, because we humans are regional. So while cyber is, is, a, is, a, is a national concern and an international concern, we need to be able to get people together and to be able to talk openly around a table. And it's very important to, to get people around a table to talk because if I was to phone you up or to 
email you and ask you about your, your, your cyber security concerns, you'd think, crikey, who's this guy and is he phishing? Whereas if you start to get people face to face and you can, you, can, um, you can start to dictate some rules of engagement, then there can be some trust and there can be some sharing. So there's a platform run by CERT, uh, which I think you'll hear about a little bit later. And we run the node for Yorkshire, and I believe there's nodes around the rest of the country um, which, you, which you can actually join. So if you actually go to cisp.org.uk, you can sign up, but you'll need a sponsoring organisation. One of those sponsoring organisations is AQL. And when I say sponsoring, we, we're not paying for you. What we're doing is we are vetting you. So we're actually asking around other people who may know you and say, OK, should we allow these people onto the platform? And trust is a very, very important part of cybersecurity. So on that note, I shall hand you back over to Mark, and, uh, and we'll continue the, dis <coughs> continue the discussion. Thanks. Thanks so much, Evan. Okay.